Good day, everybody. What perfect way to start out the video with an Olipop cherry vanilla. Tastes like cherry pie. And, of course, a delicious Italian pizza. Straight from Italy. Ah, look at that. That's quality pizza, I'm telling you. We've had a lot of pizza. That's, that's good pizza. So we got the sausage, mushroom, and onion. And we're about to work on the mirage. Oops, just lost half of it. And uh, here we are. Everything's good. And we're going to be putting in this uh, new evaporator core here. The AC system. It's actually pretty high quality. Looks pretty good. It's, uh, here, look at this. It's actually made in Japan. So I don't know if this is like a, it's not a Denso. I would have it on it. I don't know if this, this can't, there's no way this is OEM. Although with the foam, like look at how this foam is all falling apart already. This is definitely from like 30 years ago. So I got this, uh, oh actually, wow, hold on. This is actually an OEM brand new condenser. It's got the Mitsu part number on there and everything. But it was not sold as such on eBay just sold as like a replacement condenser so that's exciting so the reason I'm changing the condenser is because uh, I'm changing the compressor and uh, my theory is these are the last two things that I haven't touched well the last one the condenser I, I haven't touched its original to the R12 car um, the compressor was replaced once by me about 12 years ago and if I can get this thing out of the box it's all sealed this also says remanufactured for four seasons back in their um, date stamp here only goes up to 2003 so I'm assuming this is from a while ago so what I'm gonna do is the compressor on there is leaking, I can see it. There's dye kind of leaking out around the pulley area. Even though it was remanufactured, that's kind of a little irritating. So I'm gonna replace the compressor. However, I have to swap out the pulley and the clutch because this is for a V belt. And uh, the one on there for the turbo engine is for the rib. So that's where we're at. Um, I'm just gonna eat some more of this pizza before I move on to the next portion of this video. Actually, I can talk about it during the pizza. So, I mentioned um, YouTube monetization. Now, if you're looking to make money with YouTube, there's a few things you have to do. And honestly, for me, it's not that much um, revenue. I have another channel, and it might make 150 bucks a month or something. But my opinion is it's better than nothing. Any little bit counts. And the channel could always grow unexpectedly. And the other thing is once you're in, you're in. You're not going to lose monetization or get out of it um, unless something crazy happens. But my big push this past year, or six months at least, was getting enough view hours to hit it. So you need 3,000 hours first, which gets you this like sub level, I guess, before the major one. And you can do like um, members only videos and subscriptions and stickers and stuff that no one ever really buys. And then after that point, you hit the uh, 4,000 view hours. And it's in a rolling... Oh, I got a cold or something. Rolling 12-month period, 4,000 hours. So it doesn't reset every year on January 1st. It's like a rolling period. So this channel had, uh, it was a consistent like 1,500 hours a year. And I didn't really post much 
So it's really just residual people watching long form videos of whatever I have on here, repairing Lexus, Toyota, forklifts, skid steers, this car. And honestly, it's not so much this car, it's the other stuff. No one really watches my Mirage videos for some reason. I think it's the coolest thing I have, but it's like the least popular of my videos. Um, okay, so what was I going to say? Ah, so shorts, shorts do not count towards your total. However, shorts can grow your channel, subscriptions, viewers, etc., etc. And it gives you something to kind of do. If you want to do it daily, like I do, or weekly, monthly, whatever, shorts just kind of gives you that uh, other opportunity to expose your uh, media to new people. Um, now, you can pay YouTube to basically advertise your videos, which a lot of people do. And, um, you know, 100 or 200 bucks strategically spent over a course of a week or two or whatever um, can really drive traffic to your video. And you're basically essentially paying for hours of viewership or new um, subscribers or whatever. And it's just, that's the kind of world we live in. You, you pay and you can get stuff in return. So you can definitely get to 4,000 hours easily if you pay YouTube to promote your videos. However, you want to be able to do it organically with content and at least a video a month. I mean, that's not hard to do. You can do more, but it's not necessarily, doesn't translate into more viewership. I've just been doing everything I've been doing essentially on my cars or other people's cars or whatever, or anything I do in my life that I can video, I'll, I'll video it and put it on and see what happens. So if I'm working on the car anyways, it makes sense just to do a video and put it on YouTube. It's not like I go out of my way to break stuff to film it and put it on. But after watching a lot of YouTube, there's definitely formulas and keywords and buzzwords and all that that people use to get views. But it really starts with your channel. What is the focus? Do you have like 10 different topics and different, you know, do you do video games, cars, all sorts of other stuff on one channel? Or do you focus on one thing? And from what I've seen, most channels have a focus. So pick something that you can regularly document or video, and that will be your greatest success. There's really no magic to it. There's no like, oh, you do this and this will happen. Um, the people that have a lot of viewership are people that share the channel or they have friends or other YouTubers that mention them or promote their channel so they get viewership through other people. I mean, a basic channel like this I'd be lucky if I got five or 10,000 subscribers. I mean, I was at about 1,300 six months ago, and I think I'm at 22, 2,300. But that is literally just posting shorts every day, hashtagging, you know, keywords, this and that, linking videos, shorts, other shorts, and then consistent full full length videos. And I do try to mix it up with cars and animals and stuff like that. Um, I used to do video games, but that's like a full-time thing I've seen or found. Like if you're going to do that or stream or record you playing video games, it's got to be like hardcore, full-time, all day. Um, so yeah. But this way, you can kind of like do it and then just let it, let it work and let it uh, develop on its own. So that's what I got. So next step. 
I'm at like 34 or 3,500 hours right now since I want to say I really started pushing this channel again in um, February of 2024. And it's August 7th, 2024. So I went from like 1,300 hours to 3,500. So we've got roughly five or 600 hours. And then the magic happens where I get monetized. And again, maybe I'll make 50, 100 bucks a month. Who knows? It pays for the pizza. And then uh, we'll go from there. Do bigger and better things. And uh, just see what happens. So enough on that. If you have questions about it or comments or whatever, let me know. I can try to help if you have a channel. Um, there's a lot of other stuff like your banner and theme and keywords and all sorts of settings in YouTube that you got to do. But that's all I got for now. Um, so I got to get this car ready. It's fine now. Everything's fine. Except the AC doesn't work and the rear end's getting tired. So there's a nice, there's a special car meet coming up this Saturday. I'm going to go to, I'm not going to spill the beans yet, but, uh, maybe I'll do a post when I get there. Definitely going to have a lot of videos, uh, this weekend and next week on the car show. Uh, maybe get some exposure to this car more, but not that it matters because people just kind of walk past it and they're like ah it's just some old mitsubishi so we'll see what happens um it's kind of like i have to pick one or the other do i do the ac or do i do the diff there's not much time but i have between now and friday night or saturday and i don't have much time to test the uh, diff i don't want to throw it in have problems etc so i might wait on the diff um I don't know. We'll see. So I'm going to get started. I got to pull the intake manifold. Luckily, I can do it from above because I have an aftermarket intake manifold. I don't have to pull axles or the transfer case exhaust on the bottom. You can do it all from above. Pull a compressor out and then put a new one in, intake manifold back on. So it's a lot easier. Uh, radiator out. And uh, yeah, so let's get after it. All right, here we are. Step one. I don't even mess with the... Um, radiator drain plug over here the I just loosen the lower hose and then kind of break it loose with a bucket and let it all dump out that way I would like to report I finally have succeeded in having zero leaks in my car it's very exciting oil pan does not leak the transmission does not leak the coolant does not leak. I fixed all the uh, oil filter housing leaks over here. It's all nice and dry and the oil pan is just so happy. So time to celebrate a little bit. For the longest time, probably five, 10 years, I had uh, a drip of coolant coming down here. And I figured out that it was the there was there had to be a pinhole rust spot between the water pipe and the mounting bracket hole where the coolant pipe kind of meets the bracket that bolts to the block so i swapped out the pipe had it powder coated wrinkled black to match everything else put it in and it's good so this is very very good i don't know if i did a walkthrough with everything done and in since the diff or the rear subframe stuff the exhaust is in heat shields are working good uh, but everything back here is cool nothing really to talk about i still haven't even attempted to figure out i did figure out what i'm going to do though if you remember before i said i was going to put a um, chassis bar from here to the front control arm the mounting point probably right here well to reduce um height we don't have much height here to deal with to reduce even more i was thinking of just putting a bracket on this the subframe here and then that brace could mount directly to like a strut tower bar almost it could mount to this um, subframe and then that would be the same height as all this already and we're not going any lower so i'm pretty excited about that and then we get to shoot from here just straight along the frame rail all the way up and then tie in up here to make it even more stiff so that's my thoughts on that. 
Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna get the coolant out, pull the radiator, and then I can have access to the condenser. Nice and green coolant. Doesn't seem like there's any kind of leaks or head gasket issues or combustion gases in there. Nice guy green. Uh, I think I'm gonna get new coolant though and kind of flush it out when I do it. Just might as well. So that's done. Now I gotta pull it from the top and wiggle it out of there. So insanely easy here. We've got the uh, low side pressure pipe here and then the high side here, just a 10 millimeter down there. And then you had two mounting bolts up top. There's one 12 millimeter over here, one 12 mil millimeter on this side, and it's pretty much out. I designed this to be very modular, make sure the manifold clears, you can get the radiator in and out without having to move anything else. So here's the radiator, got a new spal fan on there, which helps um, tremendously keeping temps down at idle. Here's the new condenser, which we will compare to the old condenser. Um, I think this is pretty much empty. There might be some residual refrigerant in here, but not enough to alarm anybody, hopefully. There's a little bit. Maybe a lot of it. No, that's all. Yeah, that was it. So a tiny bit at least to maintain the integrity of the dryer which is also brand new. We don't want moisture in the system, so we gotta do this kinda as quick as possible. So I'm gonna pull this out of here and uh, try to get the new one fitted quickly and at least tightened up so we can uh, pull a vacuum, at least in the, in the interim. Okay, we've got our old condenser out. Comes with these nice little sheaths here, or whatever you wanna call them. And, some oil came out of here as I was pulling this out. I just want to see, because there really shouldn't be that much oil in here, if any. Okay, there's not really anything coming out. Not a little bit. That looks disgusting. I don't think that's normal. It's like a frothy mixture. Like, what is this? There's definitely dye in there and oil. I hope there's got to be um, old, because uh, this never came out. So I'm assuming there's old R12 oil somewhere that got in the system or stayed in the system. So, okay, we've got foam. So. We've also got a, a spal pusher on the front of this, which has been working quite well. So we're going to transfer the fan to uh, the other side of the new one. So this is going to sit like that. Move that fan right on there. And uh, that's it. We're going to swap her back in, put everything back together. So we'll see how this goes. Fan swapped over and uh, shrouding the little rubber trim over too. The old one wasn't bad. I mean, some surface rust. Some of the fins were a little bit bent, but nothing crazy. More concerned about what oil or what liquid was in here after 30 years. That's kind of the big thing. And just starting fresh, clean, brand new for our uh, Whatever it's called, I forgot. Uh, 134A, or 134A. So same with the compressor, that was kind of my thought. Uh, but yeah, we'll get this in. Same thing, this thing just kind of wiggle out of here sideways. Uh, fan first, and then kind of sideways into place. And then I have a factory, or I use the factory plug for the AC fan and the wastegate lines just kind of went, I think, under the one of the pipes. But we'll get it back in, get the O-rings on, 
and at least pull a vacuum just to get moisture out if I'm not going to do the compressor right away. But I'm going to get this back together, the radiator in, coolant in, and then kind of finish this step A, and then move to step B. Alright, we are in. It's a tight fit, and I swear something in here is just bent very minimally. Probably from all the torque. I wouldn't doubt it, but I had to just uh, make sure everything was uh, a good fit. Had to bend a little bit of lines just to make sure everything was in place. Got the fan in again. And then we are bolted on both sides. So stick the radiator in and uh, pull a vacuum. And then uh, we're done with this part at least. I'm going to hang on to this for 20 years for when somebody wants to put AC again or needs a uh, condenser. I'll have it. Uh, but that's it. This fan's new on the radiator. Uh, I think I explained that. I don't know, a video a while ago, but it just wasn't, uh, it was just a cheap eBay fan, but this one's 100 times better. So this is going to go in basically sideways, and then you drop it in straight. So, very easy. That's how I made it, so you don't have to take out a thousand things. Oh, sore. This is why I don't do big projects anymore, I'm just too, like, beat. Uh, I really had to bend up, pry on this a little bit to get it to fit. All right, I'll shut up. I'll get the radiator in. Okay, so essentially, strut tar bar, coil pack, the vacuum hose is on the back, the upper intercooler pipe, and then loosen the catch can right there. And then uh, various 14 millimeter nuts. 14 millimeter bolt and then the rest are 12 millimeter there's four on the bottom and then that's it manifold comes out so maybe 15 minutes to get it on out of there and i will try my best while holding the camera it's probably not going to work because it's an extremely tight fit right here by the brake booster and the throttle body so, again, by design, yeah, this is insane. Uh, what the, let's see here. It's just stuck on this one stud. Let me stabilize the camera here. It's stuck on that guy. Okay. Rotate that way, and we are out. Got the good old Magnus. It's heavy. Oh God. Magnus intake manifold. Magnus. Um, <laughs> stock 1G throttle body. Just rebuilt new seals. Custom elbow here to clear the brake booster. As you can see, it's pretty tight. Um, ISC out of control motor. I know they have relocations for this thing. But on mine, I just used the 2G1 or the black plastic one and then basically made these all 90 degree, um, like a loom harness coming off of it. Again, to clear the brake booster and the master cylinder, which are extremely, extremely tight. This bend, this brake line is a very tight bend out of here. but. It clears, that's a 93 to 96 Mirage brake booster. It's a lot thinner than the original. Uh, I think that's about as thin as they come. And then this is the, God, I wanna say this is the 7 8 master cylinder, which is perfect for the Willwoods. I got a video on that too, but um, yeah. 7 8 is the way to go if you have a Willwoods, at least disc brakes front and back. Uh, so here's what we look. Here's what we got underneath. A lot of wires, hoses, mis miscellaneous junk. The starter I replaced. This is brand new as of I don't know how long ago. Not that long. Uh, we've got just a custom kind of loom here with the injector connectors. 
Um, I did have, don't lose that. If you notice this connector here, I did install a crank trigger, the Kigley crank trigger uh, sensor on here, um, but it, it, for some reason it didn't work. I don't know why, it just it didn't work right. So I just went back to the stock cam angle sensor here, which works perfectly. Um, and that's it, and there's our AC compressor. So it's got this little ha happy face here. I guess that was the company that made it. And <clears throat> this I had to kind of do a custom, I don't know if this is like a custom um, two-in-one kind of adapter to clear this brick, this mounting brick I like to call it. I know some Toyotas in the 80s had the similar problem because the R12 port is a lot smaller and you got to kind of fit this on here and the, I'll show you the big problem. The big problem is getting the Hold on, the gauges, line set. Okay, so not only do you have to have the adapter, R134A adapter, clear the, the compressor, it also has to have enough room to, for this to clamp on and then pull a vacuum. And I don't think I ground this down at all under here. I'll have to look, but I don't think I did. I just found the right adapter that worked. And the um, Schrader valve, or the valve is inside the adapter, so you remove the original R12 valve, and then this is basically the new valve here. And you can pull your vacuum and then add refrigerant and all that that way. So easy, everything's easy right here because I have the AC tensioner bolt here. I can pull the belt off, I can do all three bolts and the lines right here, and it comes straight out. So. Uh, yeah, I'm going to pull this off. I'm not even going to bother pulling a vacuum until I get the new one on. And then we'll kind of compare uh, what I did on the back side, the relief valve, and then we'll swap the clutch. Hopefully you can do that. I'm assuming you just unbolt it and then put on the other one. And then uh, unplug some of these wires, the clutch wire here. And then there's another harness for everything else. Like that. Oh, the clutch actually stays. That's part of this harness. These are 12 millimeter bolts. The other thing is this bolt can't come out until you take the line off. So keep that in mind. Certain uh, AC systems are like that. So yeah, I'm going to get this off and then uh, I'll be back. So here are two identical compressors. Uh, they use the same compressor in the, all the Mirages, so 1.5 liter, 1 1.6, uh, the turbo, they're all the same compressor. Now what changed is this ring. You could swap either the V-belt or the ribbed. So you don't take off the whole clutch or anything. I wish I knew this like 1999 when I first tried doing all this. Um, that I could just swap this and then have AC still with good old R12. So I took my um, ribbed adapter, let's call it an adapter, and then it's going to go on the new compressor here. And the old one, I guess I'm just going to send it in maybe for service to see what's wrong with it or just toss it. Because I think the new one was 150 bucks or something, it wasn't too bad. Probably won't be worth it to uh, try to repair. So there's little bolts that just hold this on um, to here. So I'll do that off camera. But I just wanted to show the clutch assembly here. So this freely spins with your belt, and when the AC kicks on, the center clutch piece is gonna engage, and then that's what pumps, turns on the pump, which is the AC bunch of little pistons in here and then they suck in the refrigerant here into SUC suction and then discharge high pressure here out. Uh, so that's the same old and new. Um, this valve, so this is apparently opens at a certain PSI and then it'll close again. So I think it's like four or five hundred PSI it'll open and close. Um, I'm just going to leave this on because that's what came with it but I'll show you up close what I did on the old one. I basically bought a GM, I think it's from a Cobalt 
um, the sight glass uh, blowout, safety blowout, high pressure blowout. So I re-threaded this plug to a British standard pipe thread and I'll actually ah, fudge. I'll take this off so I can show you what I did here. It's basically a copper crush washer. I got another whole video about this, so you can watch that if you're really interested. But the compressor itself is threaded um, eighth inch British standard pipe thread, which is different from NPT and all the other, whatever the other one, there's another one too, I forgot. But there's British pipe thread, a British standard pipe thread. So you dye buy a die and then rethread this. And then this crush washer is a Dorman help kit. It's like a brake caliper or something. Banjo bolt crush washer. Fits perfectly in there. And then that replaces this one, which you can't buy these anymore. So if they go defective, you gotta buy a new compressor. Hopefully this is new to an extent. Um, but if this ever fails, I could just toss this in and be good to go for that because that is a leak point that was a leak point on my system prior so let's move on to the low pressure uh, valve here I went over this a little in the car um, just the clearance so this clearance is good here um, there's an R I don't have a wrench for that um, but there's an R12 old fitting brass fitting it looks like down there, let me see if this is a 14. Yes, it is. The midnight oil of smashing wrenches with your opposite hand. Okay, so this, and I don't know what this, I think this goop in here is just old. I don't think we're, well, maybe we are leaking from there. I don't remember. Well, um, let me, oh, and actually you can see this valve is actually not straight. I don't know if you can see that at all, but the valve is actually kind of off center. Let me investigate this a little bit further and see if... I have a better fitting that'll fit on this one. If not, this is kind of the issue I had last time. There's just not much room to get an adapter on here. I know they sell 90 degree ones too, but let me let me try figuring this out. I don't think I was leaking from this, but looking at this, maybe I was. Maybe that was another leak I had in between the brass and then the other fitting. I put um, blue pipe thread or um, lattice thread locker or some type of sealant on this one I remember but this brass one's going to be the same as this just with the valve removed let me mess around with that um, that's kind of the next step and then it's putting the compressor back in the car so yeah let's see what we can figure out all right so I think I found the solution here I bought these um, off Amazon for like 13 bucks comes with this Nice tool to remove um, needle cores or the thread Schrader valve cores or whatever they're called. And compared to this one, uh, this one looks like it's aluminum, just thinner, cheaper. This one's actually heavy duty. I don't know if it's brass also or some kind of steel. I don't remember what they said it was on the website. Um, but similar in design but more heavy duty. And also the fitting fits over it fine. It clears it and uh, everything's okay. So this one, let me actually pull out this core just to take a peek at. I can't because it's stuck as one. Yeah, this might have been like another problem I was having. It wasn't leaking from this spot but it was just really questionable anytime I put on a uh, gauge or filled it or anything it was very like oops. yeah 
Yeah, the valve itself, or the stem shader valve core thing, doesn't look too bad, but whatever. Everything is an improvement, usually. You don't ever, ever want to do something that's, like, questionable. If you can improve something when you're then uh, that's the best case outcome. So this is on nice and tight. It's seated against the old R12 valve, and I really can't tighten it anymore. It kind of seated itself nice, tightened in, and uh, it's good. So I took out the old uh, core here from the R12 system, the old Schrader core, and I this one had its own, like I said. So we will put the compressor back on, put the belt on, and the lines, pull a vacuum, go from there. All right, I forgot to talk about oil. So this is a UV dye ester oil, which is 134A stuff. The Mitsubishi factory manual says the capacity of these is five ounces of oil. Nothing came out of this, like a couple drops, which is shocking. So according to the directions here, it says, uh, if amount of lubricant removed from compressor is greater than one ounce, add to the new compressor through the suction port the same amount. Uh, if it is less than one ounce, it says add two ounces. So if we're also, I also replaced the condenser here, so it says add one ounce. So there's only three ounces left in my jar perfectly. So I'm going to put this three ounces in the suction port and hopefully it'll be happy with that. It's kind of like a happy medium between five and what they're recommending here, two to three. Um, Cause yeah, one ounce condenser it's weird because if you replace certain parts in the system you have to it's assuming oil is going to be in those parts so either way so we've got two ounces in the compressor here plus the one in the condenser in the suction port so i'm going to turn this on its side and then dump this in and then uh install it a uh, quick note on ac o-rings there's so many different sizes. There's like metric, there's imperial, there's different thicknesses. And really what you're looking for is just something that fits over the tube. Um, not too wide, not too tight, not too loose. It shouldn't fall off. I got two with this compressor. One was correct. This one looks like it'll be okay on here uh, for the suction line, but the discharge line is totally not the right size was actually too big and then this is one I had on originally you can kind of see it's like tapered so I don't think this is the right size either because uh, it shouldn't be like smushing down flat it should just kind of retain its uh, o-ringness so make sure everything's clean in here you don't want to put dirt inside the compressor and then always lubricate the o-ring itself with a little bit of mineral oil works or the same oil that you put in the compressor that's that's, that's all fine so that's kind of my little spiel on o-rings because i had like nightmares about these just not getting the right ones not finding ones that fit correctly and just having a nightmare of a time trying to get them to seal so compressors in looks good everything's tightened uh, I just got to put the lines on, and then I'll pull a vacuum and then tighten this pulley, or the tensioner, while that uh, vacuum is coming down, drawing down. Alright, I got everything back in. This whole thing took probably four or five hours to do. But pull the vacuum, let it sit for about 12 hours overnight, and there was only about a five... Uh, was it inches of mercury or however you want to call it drop so pretty good usually if I see problems it'll be at zero within you know an hour or two so I'm pretty happy with that I'm assuming just some of that is lost through the lines 
uh, but the system itself is good. So I'll pull one final vacuum and then I'll start to fill it. But this portion is pretty much done. Next I'll move on to the diff, but that'll, that'll be a different video. So hopefully this AC fiasco is done in this car. And if you need tips or advice um, on AC work on 30-year-old Mitsubishis, let me know. But uh, till the next video, thanks for watching.